Hello and welcome to the Common Good Podcast, the podcast that showcases the very best of Glasgow Caledonian University and how the institution, its staff and its research benefits people and communities both at home and overseas. My name is Craig Telfer and this is the first of our special podcast series focusing on the climate emergency and COP26. Today we are speaking with Professor Tassine Jaffrey, the Director of the Centre for Climate Justice at Glasgow Caledonia University, to talk about climate justice and how GCU is tackling the climate emergency. Tassine, it is brilliant to be talking to you today. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for having me and looking forward to this conversation. Me too. This is the first time I've been able to do a face-to-face podcast in about 18 months, so it's a great subject to, to start with. And I want to start with, effectively, the Centre for Climate Justice at Glasgow Caledonia University. What is climate justice? What do we mean by that term? You know, Craig, the, there's no doubt our climate is changing. The world is getting warmer and we are experiencing many more severe weather events from flooding right through to heat waves. As a result of that, it, there's no doubt in my mind that it's the poorest people that have contributed least to climate change mm-hmm. that are at the front line. Uh, of its impacts and are indeed suffering the most. Different parts of the world will experience the impacts in in different ways. And what we're seeing now is it's not just about the injustices for the poorest in places such as sub-Saharan Africa, you know, countries that are grappling with the depths of poverty, but it's about the poorest people, no matter where it is in the world that they live. And we're seeing that now. So the injustice issue here is about protecting those who have contributed least to climate change but are suffering the most. Okay, so what are then some of the ethical and political issues that are exacerbating climate change? You know, with, with, with ethical and, and, and moral issues, it's it comes down to historical responsibility. The de- developed nation states, the global north, have benefited enormously mm-hmm. through industrialisation to, to the point that we, we all have a, a good... Many people have a good quality and decent quality of life, right? Countries in the global south have not had the benefit of that and are needing to develop, must develop, to develop their economies, to develop societally, and and to move out of the depths of of poverty from from many places. So in a way, we do have, there's an onus on us, and it's incumbent on us all to ensure that we provide that support Mm -hmm. to those nation states that are on the front line of, of the impacts. And, and I think the important thing here is to, is to recognise that, that the impacts are, are, are so severe that we're not just talking about infrastructure damage like you see on, on the media with yeah. bridges and um, you know, buildings that collapse from, from heavy rainfall, but the resultant impact that it's having on, on humanity and the loss of life. And that is significant, and we're seeing those numbers now escalating from people who are just, you know, drowning mm-hmm. or being swept away in their homes in the global south and in the global north, and indeed in in, in other parts, of, you know, in many countries now. When we've seen the media, Tassie, we see pictures that you've mentioned there of, of damaged infrastructure, bridges, buildings that have been destroyed by flooding. What about the mental health aspect? Is, is that something that we focus enough on when we talk about climate change and climate justice? We don't focus enough on that at all. And it's it's a subject area that the Centre for Climate Justice is really working on mm-hmm. and, it, and, um, and looking at that interrelationship between climate change climate justice and, and mental health. And, and to, to, just to, to by, by way of example, my, my own experience of uh, doing field work in, in Malawi yeah. just before lockdown mm-hmm. in 2020, I had the privilege of meeting with communities who live on the shoreline of Lake Malawi. It, it took me five hours to reach those communities. Two hours on a road, two hours d- down a dirt track road, and uh, an hour on a boat trying to reach these communities. So what had happened to them was they, the country had experienced severe flooding, mm-hmm. extreme heavy rainfall, and the boulders on the, on top of hillsides had basically, you know, rolled down My and goodness. and it rolled over people's homes with people living in, and it happened at night, so they Mm -hmm. were asleep at night. And they were all just, it was all just washed 
into the lake. So the, the, the communities who I were talking to, they'd lost everything. Mm-hmm. They'd lost family members. There were dead bodies lying on, on, on the shoreline. Utensils, chairs, livestock. The clothes in the back was all that they had. And it was an absolute privilege to be able to have talked to particularly the women who are dealing with the impact and the the, the fallout of, mm-hmm. of of that huge kind of like devastation because they have no way to, mm-hmm. to feed their families. They don't know what they're going to do in terms of surviving, building resilience and any kind of hope for, for, for the future. And to make matters worse, they, st- they couldn't reach the dead, the, 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 their, their loved ones yeah. who are still under the boulders who can't be rescued. Mm-hmm. So from a mental health perspective, what they were describing to me, that they were suffering extreme trauma, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, they can't sleep, they're uh, afraid, They every time it rains they wonder how bad it, it's, it's going to be. But uh, an even further extension of that was how much they were experiencing sexual exploitation right, okay. and gender-based violence because they're vulnerable. And the, some of the women were telling me that they're having to, you know, to, to deal with that whole business of sexual exploitation in return for food aid. And that's just one example. Mm-hmm. And, and it's a very, you know, it, it's, it's a very unique example But to, to that part of Malawi. But... The work that we're doing at the centre is leading us to 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 evidence mm-hmm. that this is happening much more widely across many countries, and we just do not put enough mm-hmm. focus and attention to that to the the humanitarian crisis yeah. that the climate is having on on on, mm-hmm. on 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 people's lives. Yeah, we'll look in closer detail at the work that the Centre for Climate Justice is doing just shortly, Tassine, but we're told it's a climate emergency. This podcast is the first in the series about climate emergency. Is that the appropriate term to describe what humanity is facing at the moment? I mean, the, describe it as a, as a climate emergency. It, it's, it's, the, um, it's, it's the significance of... If we don't deal with this just now, in the next 10 years, that's that's what we have. We, we need to bring down carbon emissions and keep it to within 1.5 degrees within the next 10 years. If, if we don't, then we are spiralling out of control mm-hmm. and that emergency will, will become even more severe. My worry is that we're actually gone past that. We're actually on track for two degrees temperature height rise mm. plus. Some are even saying it could even be uh, you know, up to three degrees. So what are the consequences of that? So the consequences of that, even small temperature height rises, coral reefs, for example, they're likely to disappear if temperature height rises by, you know, by two degrees. Our children will not be able to see coral reefs beneath the sea. It's as, it is as simple as mm-hmm. that. It will some some species will become uh, extinct if we're looking at the biodiversity. If we're looking at the sustainability of our land um, and and our natural environment, but for humanity, it's it's so devastating that many parts of the world will not be able to sustain growing food, growing crops. Agriculture will, will suffer, and we will begin to see the impact that might have on famines. Mm -hmm. And to to make matters worse, what will happen, and my worry is what will happen, and we're actually beginning to see a lot of that now, is the the resultant impact is going to have on the numbers of people that are likely to migrate because they can't live in the environment Mm -hmm. That they are in now, and we're seeing significant mm-hmm. uh, numbers of people moving already. Can you give us examples that where that's taking place at the moment? I mean, the displacement is taking place in in parts of in many parts of the world, actually, um, not just in Africa, but in in South Asia, in in India, in in Bangladesh, and and Bangladesh is a, is a really really significant one because it's a country that has has a huge population numbers. Yeah. Um, and there's not many places where people can migrate to or from. So with a country like, like Bangladesh being on, on the coast, 
a lot of the coastal erosion is forcing people to move more inland because they can't keep the homes upright mm -hmm. around the bay up in Gaul and, and places like that. And they are having to move further and further inland to, to, to survive. And, and so it's extremely, it's extremely challenging. Mm -hmm. And the whole business of migration, it's, it's so hard because a lot of the time, those who are migrating are often not recognised as what I would describe as, as climate refugees. Yeah. And there's a problem in, with the terminology and the recognition of, of who these people are. And that has you know, an impact with who's going to provide support mm -hmm. to those groups of people that are moving. So we're talking about people that are not just moving within the, the borders of their own countries, but having to move across borders. Mm -hmm. And that's where it becomes extremely challenging from you know, a, a governance perspective and a, an inter international human rights perspective. Because who's going to protect the rights of those vulnerable people who have had to move across borders because they can't sustain their way of life in the mm -hmm. country that they're living in. That seems particularly challenging. Then, how do we protect the rights of these people? Do we, and I say we as a society, as in terms of like in Scotland, the UK, the world society, do we? What do we need to do to protect the rights of these people? To be honest, I, I think we we need to have. The, there's two things, right? I think we need to have the, the the right frameworks in place, but those frameworks need to have give due diligence to and recognition to the groups of people that, that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, that recognition is not there because these groups kind of like fall between frameworks yeah. uh, and conventions. And until we, we take stock of that and really push for that change, then the whole business of climate refugees is, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's in a state of flux. So it's about ensuring that we address that and we address it quickly mm -hmm. because if we don't what will happen is you know the, the knock-on effects in terms of conflict because then you will get groups of, of, of people who are conflict over access to to land mm -hmm. the finite resources that everyone is impinging on water food energy and and it, it will just escalate it will multiply so when we talk about the injustice here, it is we are talking about a potential humanitarian disaster. Mm -hmm. And the unfortunate thing about all of this is that the significance of that injustice will be felt in the poorest countries. And f for us to be able to connect to that in the global north, we're often removed from that. We don't see the reality mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. because it's not in our vision. It's not in, in, you know, it's not in a comfort zone. And a lot of people don't have any idea of the impacts and, and the devastation. This is really happening for people elsewhere. That's something I was just about to ask there, Tassine, because it's very easy living in Glasgow, living in Scotland, living in the UK to be quite removed from a different part of the world that you've perhaps no real concept of. What do we need to do then to become better informed about climate justice and climate change? We, we, we need to, it's, it's very clear to me, we, we, we need to get educated. First and, and foremost, we need to be able to talk about the impacts that climate change is having on people across the world. And we need to get that education in, uh, to, to, in the mindsets of children from a very young age because it's the it's the next generation who are you know who, who need to be more protective of our of our environment mm -hmm. so creating that awareness getting the messages out there giving you know getting people to talk about these issues mm -hmm. as well and and we just are not doing that we're not connected enough why is that the case well, in terms of why is that the case, our education curriculum is not strengthened enough to provide that insight. If you do a geography subject at high school, maybe you learn about climate change. But if you're studying modern studies, if you're doing history, mm. you're probably not likely to hear about it. So it, there is a, we have a responsibility to address that why is it that we're not talking about this? And how are we going to improve on that? 
You mentioned about children and perhaps the curriculum needs to be broader to reflect climate change. What about politicians, uh, the Scottish government, the UK government, do you think they're doing enough to tackle climate change? I mean, the Scottish government have um, more stringent targets to bring down carbon emissions than, than the UK to reach net zero by, by 2045. And um, we are, you know, in, in Scotland, you know, a bit of a powerhouse for for moving on and the journey to, to reducing emissions through renewable energies, renewable energy technology, tree planting, protecting our peatlands. So there's a lot that the Scottish government are, are doing mm -hmm. But for us to really tackle climate change, to, to bring down those carbon emissions through technical innovation, will only, we'll only tackle 40% of the emission reductions that need to take place. 60% of that needs to come from societal and behavioural change. And what I would like to see is much more focus and energy and effort in looking at that 60%. How do we look at behavioural change? How do we support society mm -hmm. to get behind this? And part of that conversation, and a very important part of that conversation, is about addressing inclusivity, equity, inequality and uh, diversity to ensure that our journey to a healthier better uh, environment and, and a cleaner environment is done in a manner that's fair mm -hmm. and just and equitable. And what does a climate just world look like? So a climate justice world is, is one where everyone has been part of the solution. It's one where no one has been left behind. Everyone has contributed. And the most important part of that climate just world is the protection of the poorest, and, and, and in many ways to help them adapt to a changing climate, but also helping them to mitigate carbon mm -hmm. uh, emissions. So there's a, there are a number of things that are, ha that are involved in, in that kind of like uh, framework there, but it's really important that, that we in Scotland certainly embrace the diverse society that, that we live in because we come from all parts of the world and makes up the fabric of our Scottish economy and, mm -hmm. and our society. So to be able to, you know, to be able to work with that framework is, is so, so, so important in the lead up to COP26. Mm -hmm. We'll come on and touch about COP26 just shortly, Tassie, because I want to talk about the work that the Centre for Climate Justice at the university does. Give me a potted history of the Centre and tell me about some of the work that you do. Well, the Centre for Climate Justice, you know, we're, we're extremely um, uh, honoured to have had the support of Mary Robinson right from the outset mm -hmm. to, to address climate justice through an academic lens. Yeah. It was a huge challenge that was posed to us to look at the evidence and the science of what climate justice looks like. Climate justice has come from a, a social movement, which is hugely important. But at the centre, what, we, what we, we do is look at research, we look at evidence, we look at impact, and we try and make sense of the conversations mm -hmm. that are happening on the ground through, through that lens and you know, use that information to, to provide insight into research that's required, where the knowledge gaps are, to produce policy briefs, to inform government, industry, other stakeholders about the state of play, really, and in its and and we 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 do that in in a way that's evidence based and it's credible, because at the end of the day, to be able to get success or change on the ground, it needs to everything needs to be grounded in solid factual information, mm -hmm. and that's what we do here. Mm -hmm. Can you give me some examples of the work that you've done that's been put into a practical context? One of the things that, that we're really proud of is, is our work working with the energy community in Malawi. We were asked to, as part of the Lights Up Malawi project, to look at to, and to really scrutinise who has access to, to the cheapest forms of solar light. 
when we came into this conversation, the platform was we need to move away from burning kerosene yeah. to getting solar lights. But when we looked at the problem and the issue carefully, our baseline was very different. Our baseline was that the poorest people cannot afford kerosene. They're burning grass as their only form of light. So therein is the, is the story already, because we, we were looking at it from a very, very different lens. So that enabled us to, to track and, and to, to work with communities, with governments and other, other organisations to think about how do we then move from that very, you know, bottom baseline to, to access to, you know, to help communities to get mm-hmm. e- access to energy. And as a result of, uh, of our work, we were able to, to embed the need to address that issue as part of the, the Department of Energy, Government of Malawi's five-year work plan, which was a fantastic yeah. thing because before we came along, it was not mentioned, it wasn't recognised mm-hmm. at all. And having it embedded in that five-year plan may, may, means when donors come in and look at what that five-year plan is all about and they see that it's there, it gives them that, that kind of like, that, that leverage mm-hmm. to then support financially work in that direction. So that's a really great example of research evidence leading to policy change in mm. one of the poorest countries in the world. What about the team that you work with at the centre? The team are, I have a fantastic team at the Centre for Climate Justice. You know, they, they all have very different skill sets. Yeah. And that's what makes it a really powerful team. Mm-hmm. It's, 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 a, it's a small team, but um, we work incredibly well. And that whole interdisciplinarity shines right through. We've got, you know, we have a geographer, environmental scientist, psychologist, you know, someone who's working on, on gender aspects. Myself, I'm both an engineer and a social scientist, and you know it's it's drawing on not just the strength of the of the team that we have at the Centre for Climate Justice, but the centre has built on affiliated staff from right across the university, yeah. which is which is brilliant because it the, the subject matter is huge, and we we're in a unique unique position to work with energy experts. Uh, in the School for Engineering and Computing. We Mm -hmm. can work with uh, experts in uh, artificial intelligence, health experts in the health school, and, you know, people who are working on on different aspects of uh, of governance and and rights from uh, business and society Mm -hmm. school. So it's a a huge effort, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's great because that's the only way this this whole subject matter is going mm-hmm. to be addressed. And it really sounds like the work you're doing ties in with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as well. Oh, there's no doubt about it. The Centre for Climate Justice ticks as, or addresses many, mm-hmm. many, many of the Sustainable Development Goals. And it is a real anchor for grounding uh, and framing the work that, that, that we're doing here. Um, and we can reflect on those Sustainable Development Goals and, and relate to them and, and, and speak directly about them and cross-reference how we have delivered against some of the targets that are set as part of those goals. And, and that's really important because it's, it's reflective because then you can look back over, you know, six months or a year or, or two years and, and really show where you've made a difference yeah. in terms of impact. You mentioned, Tassine, that your background is in engineering and is in social science, but can you tell me a little bit about your journey in academia? How did you become the director of the Centre for Climate Justice? Well, well, my journey has been quite an interesting one because my work in academia is kind of, it's my second career. Because my, my, I, I started off um, after I, I finished my, my, my doctoral studies working in the development aid uh, sector. Right. So it, it took me to working in 16 countries across the world. Um, I've worked in some of the, the poorest countries. I've worked in the depths of poverty. I've worked in small on small island states. So I've experienced at first hand over yeah. 20 years what poverty looks like, what development looks like, 
and now and and through my 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 work on on climate change and climate justice how that's another layer on you know on on the issues that experiencing on the ground and uh, i remember one of the hardest trips i ever made was out to to mozambique just after um, the civil war and they were still clearing landmines and this was um you know around sort of 90 94 95 Mm -hmm. um thereabouts but i always remember that as one of one of my favorite missions in a way because the people there had been untouched by development aid but they welcomed anyone that could come and help and support them and it was a country that had been devastated by that civil war so a lot of men had been killed through through that and it left the country with a significant number of women and single-headed households and that's where the where where my my real passion and interest for addressing gender issues really came in right when you when you visit a country like that and you and you and you understand the statistics and you understand the landscape and you understand and you see and talk to the women on the ground how challenging their life is going to be and you know driving that forward was, was has always been kind of like on on the back of my mind so you know my journey to 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 where i am now coming through development um and then embarking on my, my work in academia I really wanted to share my experiences yeah. with students and that's what drove me to coming into a university environment and sharing that knowledge through teaching um, uh, and lecturing on courses that involved sustainability and sustainable mm-hmm. development because that's how I started off at Glasgow Caledonian University I used to teach those modules on sustainable mm-hmm. development and it's great <laughs> now, Tashina, as we mentioned, this podcast series, this has been made in advance of COP26. It's taking place in Glasgow. What are your hopes for COP26? I hope f- that there is a successful outcome. And when I talk about a successful outcome of COP, I'm talking about um, an agreement that all parties to COP and to the UNFCCC are in agreement with and have the backing and support that they need to tackle climate change. Because we, we cannot have business as usual anymore. Mm-hmm. We, we need to have... Those negotiations really need to be strong and powerful, but be really listening in to the voices of discontent. And those voices of discontent are, are, are kind of like a legacy from COP25, which was in Madrid. Mm-hmm. So the... It, there's a lot of baggage that's coming into these kind of like negotiations but I think in principle what we, what we need to see is that agreement with reference to uh, bringing down our carbon emissions ensuring that there is sufficient support in terms of climate finance available to the to, to the poorest nations that are going to help them to not only um, tackle climate change in terms of terms of um, emission reductions no you know small as they may be but it's more about helping those nations to adapt to a changing mm-hmm. climate changing environment and supporting them in the journey so that they can also develop in a more sustainable mm-hmm. way the COP26 of course it was supposed to take place in 2020 but that was postponed because of the coronavirus pandemic What does climate justice look like in a post-pandemic world? Well, very, very difficult. In a post-pandemic... The thing is, with with COVID, our research has shown that a lot of financial resources that were directed towards climate action were diverted away to tackle COVID. So that has been significant because it has resulted in those countries not really being able to come up with their action and work on their nationally determined contributions and how those countries are going to tackle climate change. So they are kind of like playing catch up. So there's no doubt in my mind that COVID has had an impact mm-hmm. there. So with, with, with COP, it's really important that those issues are, are recognised and there is a, a, a bit more of a a level playing field when it comes to voice 
and um, those negotiations embrace the issues um, that those countries face. And then it's a, you know about creating that 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 space in which everyone is is you know respected and mm-hmm. and those issues are properly addressed. What about people to us seen in Glasgow, people in Scotland? What, what can we do to achieve climate justice? What, what personal responsibilities can we take on to help reduce our carbon emissions, for instance? It's, it's about a lifestyle choice. Isn't the, the, there's no doubt about it. It's about how we, how we work, about how we travel, about how we live, how we heat our homes, just to give, you know, by way of example. It's the, the transport that, 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 that we use. But to bring it down into specific examples, you know, it's about replace, replacing your, your gas boiler. It's about perhaps, you know, um, insulating your homes better. It's about uh, consuming sustainably. It's about paying attention to, to, to what we're doing. It's about do we move into to electric vehicles? Do we use more public transport? It's thinking about practical things on a day-to-day mm-hmm. basis. Switch off the lights. It's as simple as that. Mm-hmm. It's reducing our energy consumption. But in saying that, it is not that easy yeah. because not everyone is going to be able to put solar panels on the roof. Who can afford to change the, the, their boilers? Yes. Who Aye. can afford to buy organic products? Who can afford to be able to purchase an, an electric vehicle? It's a it's a it's a huge conundrum economically and societally, and it's not going to change overnight. Mm-hmm. We, we're in it for the long term. Okay, that leads me nicely on to my final question, Tassine. Where do you see the discussion about climate justice being in, say, five, ten years? In five, my my hope is that we have tackled injustice issues with reference to climate change. In the next 10 years, certainly. And I would really hope that I wouldn't have to be sitting here having to, to, you know, to say we must ensure that the needs of the poorest people are, are protected and ring-fenced. Where is the social protection to ensure that they don't fall out of the, of, of, of the net? So my hopes and my aspirations is not to be talking about climate justice in, in 10 to 15 years' time. But my, my, my worry is that we, I might still be here if these negotiations don't go well. Tassine, that was absolutely fantastic to talk to you. And it was, it was so great to listen to you about such an important subject. Thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. Thank you. I'd also like to thank everyone for tuning into this episode and stay listening for more podcasts in our special climate emergency series. In the meantime, please subscribe to this podcast to get every episode sent straight to your listening device. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and everywhere else. Until the next time, I've been Craig Telfer and this has been The Common Good Podcast. Mm